All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, session for Triple D Perth. Uh, I'm not going to give too much of an intro. I'll just hand you straight over to our speaker. So firstly, who I am will become a lot more interesting once I talk to you about what the OO Matrix is. So firstly, thanks to our sponsors, our volunteers, without that today wouldn't happen. And particularly Bankwest, where I do my day job and by night I fight the OO Matrix. So, the background. Dependency injection. Like, well, most people should probably know what that is in this room, I hope. Um, we're effectively just taking a parameter here, injecting it in there, and, you know, kind of that allows us to put in different implementations and bits and pieces and, you know, we can start managing our dependencies and, and wiring it all up. And we kind of all agree on that's dependency injection. You can't do it in Spring, Unity, various other frameworks and so forth. Might disagree about constructor or field injection, but, you know, we can have healthy debates. Then we get to inversion and control. And that's like, well, what's this thing? It's got principles. It's this. Something to do with flow, something to do with abstract, not talking to details. If you actually read the Stack Overflow about trying to answer what it is, there's arguments and really it's actually explaining dependency injection. So when I come to inversion control, I actually ask a question. Control of what? So this is where I'm going to start saying there's something that was before your eyes and I've already shown you the OO matrix. So this is the last chance, it's the opportunity. I'm giving you the red pill, it's the last chance to walk out. You're not going to be able to unsee this. So to make it easier for you to see what's going on, there are the, there are the five OO matrix problems on the screen. One of them's been solved. What dependency injection actually solved is it removed the parameters for the caller. These no longer need to be provided by the caller. They're injected in. I don't now need to provide those parameters. It's much, much looser coupling. I don't have to provide those details from the caller and I have to have, you know, this might be called from 100 different places. I don't have to provide that anymore. That coupling is actually gone. However, what about the rest of the method? What about the return type? The method name, the exceptions, the executing method, or sorry, executing thread. When we actually look at the method, there are actually five aspects of coupling to it. Any changing any one of these means you have to change all your calls. All your client calls have changed. Now think about, oh yeah, that's okay in my little method and my little class and doing my bits and pieces. But if I'm writing a library, I'm writing an API, and I have to change one of those things, I have to change it everywhere. Every call to it has to change. So what we tend to do is we keep focusing on the method. We keep trying to dress it up. We keep trying to <laughs> do different things to it. We put a new dress on it, make it look good. We put reactive styles on it. We do all these things, but call a couplings just sitting there the whole time. We kind of focus on one of those elements, but we don't focus on all five. So if we come back to what OO originally was, and if you go back to Alan Kay, who actually coined the term object orientation, well, he's actually kind of upset that he called it object orientation because the focus was on messaging. It wasn't on objects. So that's what we kind of think of when we see OO, lovely bubbles and lines between it and stuff like that. But if our mainstream OO is using methods to get these objects to talk, these methods have five different coupling points different number of parameters, different number of exceptions. All those coupling methods look different. They're shaped different. They look more like connecting jigsaw piece puzzles. So when we actually look at mainstream, that's what we get for OO. It's rigid. It can't move. Why haven't we been successful to be able to move an object between different applications. Well, it's like taking a jigsaw piece and trying to use it in a different jigsaw piece to complete it. It doesn't work. Why is refactoring so hard? You have to move all these jigsaw pieces around and so forth. It, it's difficult. It's rigid. It's not this lovely graph that we've actually kind of come to believe it was. A 
And even that concept, why do we need that? So let's start looking at unplugging you from the OO matrix. So the first thing, let's get rid of the name. We just use a lambda. Lambda, unnamed function, right, we just wrap it up. Sweet, that's pretty simple. That's done, right. I can change the name now to that method and all my callers just don't need to know the name. They could just change under the hood. That's pretty cool. So we've kind of got rid of one of the problems. There's still a couple left. So let's tackle the exception. Well, we can just inject handlers. For every exception that method throws, inject a handler for it. It's pretty simple code. Now my methods will never actually propagate their exceptions back to the client. You know, when you think about how we do most things, you usually escalate an exception in an office to a manager. You don't actually tell your sales people, oh, sorry, we can't do this right now. So we, you know, we can inject that. Well, then we've still got more problems. Well, we can get the same process to the thread. Let's just inject an executor. Now I can choose a different execution pool to execute that method. No, it could be the same thread as the caller by just using a synchronous one that just calls through, or it could be its own thread pool. It's now wrapped up. I can choose that and what executes that method. We're kind of just left with one now. And this one we've already solved. We do it in our web servers all the time. Here's a request context. Ah, request context. So think about a controller. When it wants to put the data to the view, it loads everything into the request context, then the view can pick it up from there. Well, we do the same thing as we call these methods. We load it to a context, and then dependency inject into the further methods down the line. Now I can pass state down all those methods. So putting it all together, and don't try and read the code. The slides are downloadable, and I'll put the link up later. But there you go. What we've now done is we've inverted this problem. Our call now is the same the whole time. It doesn't change. It's always going to be one message. Our implementation, however, can be whatever it wants. I can change it. I can add more dependencies. I can change the threading of it. I can even change exceptions out of it and so forth. I can even change what downstream things I call. They can all just quite happily change, and my caller doesn't even know. Just passes a message through. So with those things, we've got the decoupling going. So to compare this and go, well, oh, this is the difference between your dependency injection and an actual, what I consider an inversion of control or inversion of coupling control container. Dependency kind of says, here's, here's the fields you inject. And we kind of do that uh, threading and all that modeling and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's your problem. You deal with it. We, we, we do that stuff. But, you know, threading's hard. We don't want, you know, if we've got lots of junior developers on our team, we won't want to have to have them do all that part. If I've got lots of pieces and things all connected together and they're all joined by the method, trying to move them around doesn't work. Well, this does it. It's that simple bit of code. And we actually only write this when it comes to the Office 4 framework which actually implements this, this, these concepts. Because we can derive everything in that box from the method signature. If you know it's, a continu if you know it's one of the continuation or handlers, you can determine that by the parameter type. If it's not that, then it's one of the dependencies you need to inject in. And you can even work out the thread, because I could look at the parameters and go, ha, ah, that one needs a data source, or it needs an entity manager. I need to put that on its own synchronous thread pool. If it's not, well, I could probably execute on the current thread and be safe because it can't get anything else without it being in injected. So that's kind of working great for OO. And I did mention functional programming. Now, functions have the same problem as much as they would like to say otherwise. They still have it. Okay, they don't really throw exceptions, but they do return them as values. The problem is still there. But I wouldn't dare suggest that functional programming should lo learn from OO. I'd probably be blamed right here for that. <laughs> so 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, functional program, they listen to mathematics. So, does anyone know who Carl Jacobi is? Oh, cool. Well, he was the one that did foundational work in eclipse fun or elliptic functions. So if you know what elliptic functions are, they create elliptic curves, elliptic curves, well, they're public, private key foundations, and that's Bitcoin. There you go, there's my mandatory Bitcoin <laughs> reference. So what Carl, uh, what Carl Jacobi said is invert, always invert. If the problem is too hard to express and clarify, invert the problem to get clarity on the problem. Now, there's a perception that functional programming is hard. I mean, it's, it's elegant, it's beautiful, it's got typing, it's got all this type of stuff. But when my type error actually starts going multiple lines, I'm scratching my head and I'm going, okay, how do I work that out? So, it could be perceived as hard. So, can we actually take the inverting to the functional language? Well, when you look at function composition, the parameter coupling just expands out. Because you never actually pull anything in underneath, you're always passing in. And this is why they say functional programming doesn't need dependency injection, because you always pass it in through the higher order functions. You never actually, it never calls out to anything. Everything is always passed to the function. So you, what happens is everything gets passed to the function. As you start putting more function together, it just gets wider and more complex. So if we flip that and did the same principles to this, well, we turn it upside down. I send it a message, and it can then send messages to other functions, and it can send messages to other functions. Pretty much an actor model. And if you actually do inversion control and functions, it creates you an actor model. It actually creates a much better actor model, because most actor models are implemented with single threads per actor. This uses prototype threads. If anyone has seen that edge of computer science, I can use one thread and do 100,000, well, actually, on this laptop with a gig, I can do a million actors quite quickly, and I can create and destroy actors at 100,000 a second. Because I'm not actually creating threads, it actually just creates these in-memory representations and then just destroys them. And because it's the best analogy I can think of it, is if you go to a business and say, oh, can I, say, have a home loan? Well, do you know how many departments get involved in that? Do you know what a... Well, if you're in a functional language, you probably find out with all the, you know, the, we've got to expose all that stuff. Here, you just send it to it, and then it just goes and sends messages off to the bits and pieces. So, all nice theory. It's like, cool, that's, that's nice. Where do we see this? Well, what's the pattern behind a microservice? You get an object, you turn it into JSON or XML, and then you send it over the wire in HTTP, or you send it in a message queue off to some servicer. What's a servicer do? The servicer injects its dependencies. It might inject other client calls to other microservices, and then it picks a thread to actually execute it. It's just the same pattern. However, it's heavyweight got a lot involved, I mean, here's sidecars and all these other bits and pieces to them. Oh, that's a lot, of, a lot of stuff just to make a call. So what we're actually doing with IOC is just doing it at the function level. You can just call straight through, it sends a message, it's just a lambda function that takes a parameter, which is effectively a message, and then just calls it different through. And it's done at the method level, much more lightweight, and it grows. Because what happens is I just take one of those lines and make them a queue. Now I can have them, those two graphs in separate processes. And then as it gets bigger and bigger, I can sort of get further lines and make them queues, and then you can just grow. We kind of get this organic growth. You dare say that actually these systems get easier to build the more there is of them. There's more things to wire up and hook. So I'm going to leave you with a final thought on this. And, oh, sorry, yes, Alan Kay is now getting his vision, so he's happy. He might come back again. Um, the final thought is, what does the method actually represent? It actually represents pushing and popping things off the stack, which effectively represents a machine. 
Where in the world do you see thread stacks? I mean, Alan Kay got his OO vision from chemistry. I took the office floor designs from how an office interacts, which is all messaging. We see neural synapses as passing messages. Where's, where, where do we see a thread stack in the real world? Basically in the machines. So if we design our APIs based on methods and those things, we're designing them coupled to machines. Rather than a much more organic model. And now how do I refactor that? I just redraw a line. I need something else to call something, I just draw a line. If the message that goes through it needs to be something slightly different, well, I can just put another method in the form and transform that message and then call it on. Yeah, yeah, my refactoring job, turned, instead of being hours and probably days of trying to turn some engine and that machine that's highly coupled with this jigsaw, my refactoring's now like a couple of minutes and then I get on with something else for the day. I literally just draw the refactoring. And this isn't just theory. This is actually a production-ready framework that's actually ready to use. That is actually a configuration, one of the apps that we built with it. How would you like to go into an app and see that and go, that's how it all works, and then you can just drill into that and double-click on that and drill and down to where the code is. And then if I have to change things, I can wire things in. If I need to do new things with the flows, I can do it. And that's a very simple app. You can imagine this can get quite big, quite complex, and still give you that visualization into it. Um, I always find dependency apps, they're a bit like, here's a novel, I'm going to rip out every page, throw it on the floor and say, put that back together. But, uh, I'm wiring, how do the dependencies hook up? How do these pages get ordered together? It doesn't really tell you. Here, because we use the wiring of the method flows as configuration, we can graphically represent it and then give you an overview of how your app actually works. Then you can take that to the business and you can show them how the, all the bits and pieces work. And it's, it's, it's much, much easier. Life gets easier. It's in what I'd call a floor plan of your actual application. So in summary, when you actually look at dependency injection, compared to what I consider a version of coupling control, there's a silent coupling in there, you can see dependency injection is actually only one of them. There's four others. Well, there's two others, but there are four other aspects. They're covered off by what I consider thread injection, and if anyone knows a little bit about continuation injection, or a better way to think about that is, is functional injection, or method injection. Um, there's a few links there. Who I am, I'm the founder of the framework. And what we're looking for is, well, we've built it, we've proven it, we're building our apps in it. It's now time, and if I use the matrix analogy, I'm Morpheus. I'm looking for the Neos. I'm looking for those early adopters, those people who want to try it out on their hobby projects, those who want to take it to their... I'm looking for you to take it on and, and, and drive it out and fight back against the machine. Whenever I hear API design, I'm going, oh, there's an agent. <laughs> You know, I might even say the same about functional programmers. Oh, there's another agent. Um, they move fast, they're smart, but they're still bound by the coupling laws. So, um, so there's the slides, there's my handles. I'm here all day. If you've got any questions, I can add, I'll have probably time for some now, and I'll be around for all day to answer questions. All right, we have probably have time for just one question. So if anyone wants to hand up, there we go. Uh, can you briefly describe what the hosting model looks like for these applications? They're literally just a normal app. Like you think about a Spring app, you just can host it in anything. We run an arm um, in Google Cloud. I can run it. Um, it's just a Java app basically. So you can run anywhere, it hosts itself, um, it doesn't need anything special, it's just how you build it. You can even put these into your servlet containers. So you can just bed them in the server. They run anywhere. Um, but they run, as I say, they don't need extreme threading models because they actually take their, they can inherit the threading model from the container and then work through that too. So... 
Yeah, so you just take advantage of that as an underlying platform. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. I'm going to struggle to shake your hand right now, but that is a token of our appreciation. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed it. We are heading out for morning tea now out in the foyers and then the next sessions will be beginning at 10.55. Thanks, guys.